All right, good Thursday afternoon. Uh, today we're going to talk about what happens after World War I ends. And we're going to start with something called the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the basis of the treaty, the, the Treaty of Versailles is going to be the peace treaty that officially ends World War I. And it's going to be based on the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson. I'm going to hope that you've read the 14 points by now. If you haven't, stop for a second, go read them. It should take you probably 15, 20 minutes, and then come back and watch the rest of this. It's important to understand what's going on so you know what the treaty is supposed to be based in. All right, shoo shoo, go read it. All right, if you're still here, I'm going to guess that you are, have already read it. Um, Woodrow Wilson, his 14 points, it's going to be all about openness, fairness, treating people like equals, and that's what the Treaty of Versailles is supposed to be based on, but in reality, the Treaty of Versailles is going to be based on revenge. Uh, the 14 points, they do shorten the war because Germany thinks that's what the peace treaty is going to be based on. And so Germany surrenders, thinking the 14 points is what's going to be used for the peace treaty, and they're going to be really, really disappointed here in a couple of months. Uh, what I think the most important points from the 14 points are, uh, Woodrow Wilson, he wants no secret negotiations, open diplomacy, everything should be out in the open. He wants self-determination, he wants nationalism to create new countries, and he wants the people of those new countries to vote and choose what their country is going to look like. Uh, he wants equal trade among all, um, he wants fair open trade on the seas, he wants fair open trade between countries. He wants military sizes to go down. He wants military armaments to go down. He wants the number of weapons, number of guns, everything to go down. And then, of course, freedom of the seas. He thinks people should be able to go where they want to. Now, you've got three main players at Versailles. There are other countries involved, but these are going to be the main three. The first one is David Lloyd George. He's from Britain. He's the top picture. David Lloyd George, he becomes the, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Uh, he's a moderate guy, he's in the middle of the road, but he won election using the slogan, the platform of Hang the Kaiser. So that means even though he's a moderate, he's kind of set himself up to be very, very angry. David Lloyd George, his goal was to destroy the military might of Germany and to destroy the economic might of Germany. And he also wanted German colonies. The other guy, uh, his picture is in the middle, that's George Clemenceau. He's actually a physician who becomes the Prime Minister of France. His main goal was revenge. He was alive during the Franco-Prussian War. He was alive when Napoleon III was embarrassed. He was alive when Otto von Bismarck declared the country of Germany a thing while in Paris. So he wants revenge for being mistreated and embarrassed by the German government. He wants Germany weakened as much as possible, and he wants a guarantee from the United States that the U.S. will defend France from Germany. Now Woodrow Wilson, that's his picture down there at the bottom. Uh, when you look up Woodrow Wilson, this is what every president should be. He is a former governor, he's a former educator, he was a political science professor. This guy has it all. I mean, um, but he has some problems. He's idealistic, he doesn't like to compromise, he thinks he was right all the time. Um, he is actually not in a position to dictate any terms to David Lloyd George or George Clemenceau. I mean, most of the fighting happened in France. The United States got there last minute and late, where Britain and France lost millions of people. The United States didn't lose that many. So Woodrow Wilson, he comes out with his big idea, the 14 points. He's like, this is what we need to do. And David Lloyd George and George Clemenceau were like, right, we'll, we'll listen to you, but not really. Because Woodrow Wilson knew that the governments probably weren't going to listen to him, his plan was to appeal to the people of Europe and have the people of Europe put pressure on their governments to do what he suggests. Alright, the negotiations open up. 
Uh, David Lloyd George and Clemenceau, they have no plans at all to accept Wood Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Woodrow Wilson is still hoping that somebody will listen to him. And the very first problem that Lloyd George and Clemenceau have is the open negotiations. Uh, they were not willing to accept that in any way because they thought that people could use that for political grandstanding. If David Lloyd George says something in public that the people of Britain don't like, his enemies could use that against him. Now, if there were negotiations done in secret and then everything became open, they could deal with that. But they, David Lloyd George and George Clemenceau didn't want to negotiate in public. When Woodrow Wilson wrote Freedom of the Seas, he did it so vaguely that nobody even knew what that meant. Uh, does it include passenger ships of all nations, passenger ships of uh, enemy nations? Does it count for submarines? Does it count for hospital ships? Woodrow Wilson left that so vague that nobody knew how to interpret it. And then there's this idea of popular determinism, the, the self-determination. That meant creating new countries, that meant existing countries losing territories, that meant redrawing traditional borders, and sometimes that meant just putting countries together that had no business being together. A great example, Czechoslovakia. It doesn't exist today. Today we have the Czech Republic and the Republic of Slovakia, but after World War I, this new country of Czechoslovakia was created. You had two different languages, two different ethnicities, two different groups of people. They didn't like each other. And on top of that, you had three and a half million Germans living in that country who wanted nothing but to return to Germany. Uh, Yugoslavia is another one. The country of Yugoslavia uh, is created at the Versailles Conference. There were six different nation states who hated each other and the only thing that holds Yugoslavia together is a series of dictators up until the early 1990s. And in the early 1990s, Yugoslavia falls apart and there have been multiple wars in that area of the country because of this. Today, Yugoslavia is broken up into Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, and a couple other countries as well. And that was not a pretty breakup. One thing that pretty much everybody can agree on is the idea of a League of Nations. This League of Nations was supposed to be a place where everybody could get together and talk. Uh, if people were able to deal with security threats, then the security threats could work themselves out and peace would be kept. This is the precursor, this is the forerunner, this is the, the prototype, if you will, of the United Nations. Now, what the League of Nations is actually going to end up being used for is to enforce this upcoming treaty on Germany. And the United States actually does not join the League of Nations because the United States wanted to stay out of Europe as much as possible. A very famous quote by George Clemenceau, uh, God gave us the Ten Commandments and we broke them. Wilson gives us the 14 points, we shall see. So that tells you right there, they're not too on board with Woodrow Wilson and his ideas. All right, the idea behind the League of Nations. And before I do this, I want to give you your word of the day. Today's secret word is Easter. I hope everybody has a happy and safe Easter. So secret word is Easter. All right, so the League of Nations, what was it supposed to do? Collective security. If all the League members agree to preserve the other members, if all the other League members agree to come to the aid of other members, if all the League members agree to preserve the territorial integrity of their neighbors, then that's going to be a collective peace. And if one country invades somebody else, all the other countries are supposed to protect that one. So if Belgium is protect is invaded by Luxembourg, then all the other countries around Luxembourg will invade it to save Belgium. Now there are some questions. Does this count for the new created countries? Is this only for existing countries? Does this count for countries that couldn't possibly defend themselves? And 
does this count for the United States? Even if it does not join the League of Nations, is the United States going to be required to get involved? These are all questions that were not answered and nobody knew the answer to. So what were the ultimate treaty terms? Well, Germany is going to lose some territory. It loses about 13% of its territory and it loses about 10% of its population. Most of that territory ends up going to Belgium and Denmark. Some of it goes to Poland. Some of it goes to the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. There's a demilitarized zone created between France and Germany. It ends up being about 50 kilometers wide. I put 50 miles there on accident. It should be 50 kilometers. And it becomes known as the Rhineland. Um, originally France wanted 200 kilometers, but Woodrow Wilson talked them out of that. There's a strip of land known as the Polish Corridor that's created. Uh, there's this little itty bitty strip of land that stretches from where Poland is up to the Baltic Sea just to make sure Poland had access to the sea. And that's going to cut Germany into two parts. You're going to have main Germany, and then next to Russia, you're going to have uh, East Prussia. And the city of Danzig, which was originally a German city, is going to become a city controlled by the League of Nations. Eventually, that city is going to be renamed Gdansk. And Gdansk still exists today as part of Poland. All the German colonies are taken away. And then most interestingly, Germany is ordered to repay everything. Even though Germany did not start the war, Germany is accused of fueling the war. The blank check has a big part of that because Germany basically said, here Austria-Hungary, fill in the zeros, we'll pay it. So now Germany is being forced to pay that check. The total cost of the war in 1918 was 33 billion dollars. Germany had to pay for the actual cost of the war Germany had to pay for the damage suffered to civilians, and Germany had to pay for the pensions of everybody hurt in the war, the widows, the orphans, the, the veterans. $33 billion today. I looked this up yesterday when I made this PowerPoint. That is $565 billion today. Germany limited to 100,000 soldiers. Germany could not have an air force. Germany could not have a, a true navy, the German army limited to 100,000 soldiers. Now what happens is Germany keeps the best 100,000 soldiers, but millions of people are thrown out in, this, out in the street. Millions of people become unemployed because the German army is shrunk so much. Now post-war economic collapse. This is what happens in the 1920s. Uh, you might have heard of the term Roaring Twenties. Well, in Europe, the Roaring Twenties don't happen. Uh, there's war debt. Uh, 350 million 1918 dollars has to be repaid. Uh, that is several million, several billion dollars today. Uh, Germany's currency collapses, and the cost of World War One is not paid off until 2010. Um, Germany eventually bakes good on their reparations, and it takes until 2010 for Germany to pay off the debts they owe. Overseas markets that used to belong to Britain are forever lost to the United States or Japan. Uh, countries just randomly print money that's not backed by anything, and the money's worthless, and that makes inflation go crazy. And then you have this huge number of deaths. Over 20 million people die in Europe, that's including civilians, and then another 21 million are wounded. So there's a lot of disability claims, there's a lot of population losing. Some countries, such as France, lose more than others. And then we have German reparations. Germany, in 1921, actually tries to pay back their debt. Uh, when they try to make their first payment in 1921, they do it in good faith. But it's so hard on their economy that their economy shatters, their money becomes worthless. And I put in here some numbers to kind of show you how that is. Uh, in 1914, a German Reichmark was basically up a quarter. For every four Reichmarks, you had one U.S. dollar. In 1918, the Reichmark has devalued itself. It now takes 64 Reichmarks to make one U.S. dollar. By 1923, uh, November 1923, it takes 800 million marks to make one dollar. So we go from being a quarter in 1914 to much, 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 much less. 
In fact, November 1923, uh, the German money was worth more as firewood. To be, it was worth more burned than it was as currency. There are pictures and there are stories of German citizens taking wheelbarrows full of money trying to go to the store and buy bread and by the time they get to the store their money can no longer buy that loaf of bread. In Germany in the early 1920s it's a disaster and, and it's a harbinger of things that are going to come. And because Germany cannot pay for the war, France actually invades Germany and steals all of the industrial equipment from Germany to regain some of the stuff that they've lost. Now what about the United States? Well, I know it's not U.S. history, but you got to remember, sometimes the U.S. is part of world history, and this is one of those times. In the 1920s, the United States roars because the war does not hurt the U.S. economy. Uh, the U.S. economy keeps going. Factories still produce stuff. Businesses still make stuff. People still buy stuff. So production soars, profits soar. If you've ever read The Great Gatsby, or if you've ever seen in a Great Gatsby movie, think of that. The speakeasies, the parties, the lavish dress, the fancy times, uh, flappers. Well, by the time we get to 1928, there's this huge wave of stock, mar stock market speculation. Uh, you could do something called buying on the margin. You only had to put down like 10% of the money and you could buy stock. So for example, if, I don't know, uh, Walmart stock is worth $100, you only had to pay $10 and you own the stock. And the other $90 was thought to be paid off as the stock gained value. Uh, they didn't realize that the stock market could go down and up. It was because it had been up for so long. So you have 9 million Americans putting their money in the stock market for the first time. They're buying on the margin. They're only paying 10% of the cost of the stock. So people are investing much, much more heavily than what they can actually afford. Then if there's low taxes. It's easy to get credit. And this is a recipe for disaster. By the time we get to 1928, uh, construction is starting to slow. Auto sales are starting to slow. Companies have overproduced and nobody's buying anything anymore. Uh, the Federal Reserve warns banks. The Federal Reserve warns biz, uh, like stock market businessmen. And nobody listens. They don't think anything's going to happen. Well, October 24th, 1929, the stock market plummets over 11%. Um, the next Monday, stocks kind of go up a little bit. But on Tuesday, the 29th, Stocks fall, and they don't stop falling for nearly three years. In September of 1929, the stock market was at the highest it had ever been up to that point, uh, 381 points on the stock market. And three years later, it's down to a low of 41. Um, economic ruin. People lose so much money. Um, some stocks lose over 70% of their value. This causes what we know now as the Great Depression. And there are a couple of different causes. There's the maldistribution of wealth. Not to talk like Bernie Sanders or anything like that, but the top 12% of the country owned most of the wealth. The bottom 50% only got about 15% of the income. So you were either very, very wealthy or you were nothing. There's overproduction. By 1929, those at the lower end of the economic scale, they can't purchase any of the consumer goods anymore. And there's only so many things you need to buy. You only need so many TVs, you only need so many cars, you only need so many light switches. And once you have that many, you don't need to buy it anymore. But businesses kept producing, kept producing, kept producing. Uh, then we have Europe. Europe's destroyed, as I mentioned in that last slide. Europe can't afford to buy anything from the United States. Foreign sales drop and this depression gets worse. All right, well, that's all nice and neat, but what's the actual impact? We've got some numbers for you. 
GMP, gross national product. That's the value of everything that a country makes in a year. Between 1929 and 1932, the GNP of the United States drops by 50%. To put that into real numbers, in 1929, the value of the United States was $104 billion. That means the U.S. produced $104 billion of stuff every year. By 1932, that number is down to $59 billion. There are over 5,000 bank failures, and it's not like today where if your bank fails, another bank comes in and buys it. If your bank failed, you lost everything. Your life savings were gone. Unemployment rate gets to 25%, and farm prices drop over 60%. Farmers start losing their farms, and more people are out on the street. The president at the time, Herbert Hoover, uh, he is a believer in this idea called volunteerism. So he asked businesses to keep people employed, to keep paying wages, and to keep producing goods. Businessmen look at Herbert Hoover like he's crazy because the business of business is to make money. Then Herbert Hoover goes to state governments and local governments. Will you please take care of the unemployed? Will you t please take care of the poor? And both state and local governments are like, look, man, we don't have the money to do this. And then Herbert Hoover actually recommends a tax increase in the middle of the Great Depression. And uh, a lot of people really dislike Herbert Hoover during the Great Depression. But if you want to know more information about that, take world history, not world history, but take U.S. history too, and I, I spend uh, two days talking about the Great Depression and what happened. All right, so that is your lecture for today. Uh, a couple of notes. Number one, check the course calendar in case there's anything due. Number two, Monday, registration for summer semester opens up. Summer semester is online only. And then number three, make sure you have a good and safe Easter. We'll talk to you next week.